The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Brower is the Minnesota State Demographer um, and Director of the Minnesota State Demographic Center. She became State Demographer in, 20, in February 2012. Um, she joined uh, the center after working at Compass on um, the Compass project here at Wilder. Um, she has a PhD in sociology from the University of Michigan and also a master's from Berkeley School. So she's going to talk to us a bit about planning for the 2020 census. Thank right. you so much. For Thank you. Me. Oh, you did. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Um, in my years of schooling and training, I can say that um, very, very little was dedicated to doing the kinds of activities that I'm doing right now, which is outreach, community organizing, and so I'm learning all kinds of things from people, and I'm, I'm keeping my ears open, and give me your thoughts uh, and your, your thoughts and your prayers. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but it is a very different, it is a very different activity, right? So I was trained as a sociologist and, a, you know, in statistics and demography, um, and uh, no part of that is just how do you energize a community to respond and educate a, a community to respond. It's absolutely fun work so far. I'm having a blast doing it. But uh, indeed, it is something that's very different from what my background has taught me to do. Um, and so, you know, we're just we're just going with it. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the changes that are happening Uh with the census, with the 2020 census, some of them are brought about because of changes at the federal level. Some are brought about because we're doing things a little bit differently at the state level this time around. So I'll tell you what kinds of activities uh, are happening and will be happening in the coming uh, two years, two and a half years. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, congressional apportionment because I'm so excited to be in front of this crowd. Usually when I talk about apportionment, it's like blank faces. <laughs> but I want to talk about some of the specifics because I know that this is the right crowd to kind of understand where we, uh, where we stand with respect to that. So that's my plan. Um, and also plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end, absolutely. Only clicker doesn't work. There we go. Got it. <laughs> okay. Um, I have learned from uh, the outreach that I've done so far that some of these things are um, not uh, shared knowledge. And so let's start at the beginning with some of the census basics. It happens on April 1st in the years ending in zero. Uh, it's in the Constitution above the fold, as you will, Article 2. It is the way that our forefathers envisioned that we would um, be able to ensure fair representation. Uh, so it's really a cornerstone of our democracy. It's one of the ways that we make our democracy operate as fairly as it possibly can. It's really hard to overstate the importance of the census, but I have learned that uh, in some ways it's so big, I need to kind of break it down and give you like these very basic facts about why we take a census, uh, because, because it seems really obvious to people uh, that it's an important thing, but um, it's difficult to kind of get your head around just how important it is. Um, between uh, 1970 and 2000, there was a long form of the census, and those are all those questions about income, educational attainment, occupation, those things that people like us, researchers, love to dig into and understand, uh, you know, the, the populations that we study. But uh, beginning in 2010, it shifted to a short form, uh, only 10 questions. Uh, and the long form was shifted to the American Community Survey, which is an ongoing survey conducted by the Census Bureau, which is enormous. Um, it's it's uh, still giving us much of the data that we need for these communities today, but it's on an ongoing basis, uh, not part of the decennial census anymore. 
This is really important. You know, maybe you all know this already, but a lot of people don't understand the, the kind of reaction that I get when I'm talking about the census is, I don't want to tell you information about my income. I don't want to, or I don't want to tell the Census Bureau anything about, you know, whether I'm able to uh, bathe or dress myself. That is none of anybody's business but my own. Uh, but rest assured, the decennial census, when we're talking about decennial, it is just... 10 questions, very basic questions about demographics such as age, race, ethnicity. Uh, there is one on home ownership there, but it's really the basic uh, questions. The 2020 census, uh, decennial census questionnaire is not yet finalized, uh, but the questions, uh, the proposed questions will be sent by the Census Bureau to uh, Congress uh, next month. And the proposal, as far as we can tell, is that it's going to be very similar to what we have seen last time and that it'll take the short form. This is the 2010 census. I just wanted to, to show you um, what it looked like last time and kind of the basic questions that are there. And this is actually off the 2018 census test. Uh, there may be some changes coming up that, that we can expect to see. Um, there had been a proposal by the Census Bureau based on some research that they had done to integrate the ethnicity question, whether or not uh, you are Hispanic or Latino, into the race, the group of race questions. That is not happening now. There will be two separate questions, just as there has been in the past. Um, and that is a decision that happened relatively recently. Um, but it looks like what will happen... Uh, what's being proposed anyway, what's being tested um, right now in the field is that there will be a write-in category for both people who self-identify as white or people who self-identify as black or African-American. And both of those things are new, and particularly for Minnesota, that can be really useful uh, for our black or African-American community where we have so much diversity um, with respect to newer immigrants and African Americans who have been here for generations. So that is uh, an improvement. I actually have a call into the Census Bureau. I haven't received my answer yet about why there is not, at least on this form, their promotional copy, why they don't have a major Asian category. I know that they're testing different panels, and so it may just be the one that they happen to print, but um, Stay tuned for that. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure why, why there isn't that major uh, category there. Um, there's been some talk about a citizenship question added to the census as well. This is something that was requested in December by the Department of Justice to the Census Bureau saying that it needed information on the decennial census at the level of geographic detail that it couldn't get from the ACS in able to enforce uh, part of the Voting Rights Act. Um, and so there was, you know, a, a letter sent to formally request that a citizenship question be put on the 2020 census form. Uh, the Census Bureau right now is saying that it's investigating, um, it's researching, investigating um, what it's going to do with that. Um, and then there was some talk about um, an executive order uh, requesting that um, the citizenship question be added to the long form of the census was in, in the memo, which of course doesn't exist. But the question is, you know, is there any kind of push behind, from the administration to include a citizenship question as well, in addition to um, the Department of Justice? A whole bunch of people are mobilizing around this, saying that's a terrible idea to include citizenship, that it'll, uh, it will depress response rates, um, and uh, including some, some folks locally here um, and many researchers saying we don't think it's a great idea to include it because of what it will do to the response rates and also because it hasn't been tested uh, in, in the tests that are the questionnaires that have gone out so far. So. That remains to be seen what will be proposed next month. Um, typically, the Census Bureau proposes the questions, gives the question wording, and then Congress doesn't do anything with it, <laughs> and then it goes into effect. Uh, it may be different this time just because of, of this 
the addition of this question and the interest in particular around this question. Our own legislature, there's a bill proposed at the state level in support of not including, <laughs> I guess in opposition to uh, including this question at the federal level, so. Okay, there are also some changes that are going on with respect to uh, census operations this time around, what the Census Bureau is doing to collect the data. In general, what's happening is there is a greater reliance on administrative data, both to, to, um, to create the address frame or the universe of uh, everyone that will be, the households that will be enumerated, uh, but also there'll be a greater reliance later on with respect to non-response follow-up. There's some expectation that some of the non-response follow-up that would have been done in the past will be shifted to administrative records. I haven't exactly seen a plan on how that will happen. I don't know that it is completely set in stone at this point. A lot's up in the air, which we'll see in a moment as well. Um, a new thing with the census this time will be how we count the population, how the Census Bureau counts the population. And for the first time, there will be an internet response option. People will be mailed, will have a mailing, uh, depending on where you live, if you're in an area that has a high proportion of people with internet access, um, you may be mailed a postcard with a code on it that urges you to go and fill out the census form with that code. Apparently, you don't have to have that code to fill out your census online. You can do it otherwise, but that it's encouraged to be able to help with the tracking. So that's a change that's, that's happening this time around, uh, and this is part of what's being tested currently and has been tested uh, in the American Community Survey, where about half of the responses now are uh, internet over the internet rather than uh, a paper form. People will still have the opportunity to fill out a paper form, uh, even if they get that, um, that mailing that encourages them first to go online. That's really just to push as many people as possible to the cheapest alternative <laughs> to fill out the form online. Uh, they will later receive a paper form if they don't do that. Uh, there will also be an option uh, to call in, we're being told, that you can call in and give your information over the phone. So. I, I do hear some fears kind of bubbling up about people who may not have internet access and how are they going to fill out the census. They will still have the option to uh, fill out a paper form if they're in one of these areas where um, it's hard to access the internet. Even if they're not, they'll have that opportunity. The census environment this time around is super tricky. <laughs> it has been in the past. Some of the things that are tricky this time have always been tricky, but it's really heightened right now, in particular because of the political situation around immigration, uh, around fears and mistrust that people have of government. That's always been the case, but especially now. <laughs> and so that's one of the things that I know will be one of the challenges that we face. Those of us, I see faces I know that will be working on doing census outreach that we face doing this outreach. Uh, in, in particular, um, declining response rates. People are fatigued uh, by filling out uh, different kinds of surveys about how they're Chipotle visit was, for example, how their, you know, whatever it is, what their experience online was, we get lots and lots and lots of requests for information. So how, you know, in general, what's been happening is response rates have been declining. That's continued over the course of, you know, since the last census. Um, and it's related in part to being a highly mobile population, uh, perhaps with um, fewer ties to, um, to a, a stable um, single living arrangement. So there's all kinds of things that are happening, how our society is changing, uh, that makes us difficult to stay still and be counted in one spot accurately and not be missed. Um, that's always been the case, but I would say, especially in 2020, um, many of these concerns are, are heightened. One of the big concerns that people have that comes up time and time and time again, it can be in a 30 second conversation or it can be in, you know, a long in-depth workshop, uh, concerns about 
the security of the data at the Census Bureau. And so um, for me, uh, I've just been kind of preaching <laughs> the gospel of how the data are protected at the Census Bureau. I know that this may or may not uh, influence people who don't feel safe filling out their form, but at least people who understand um, people who are in our position should understand what those safeguards are. Um, you should know that uh, Title 13 is a, a federal code that specifically protects data going into the Census Bureau, that data go in, they don't come out, <laughs> except for under very unusual circumstances, uh, that the IRS, the FBI, welfare, immigration, they don't have access to the data, at least legally. <laughs> there are legal structures in place. If someone were to access that, they would be doing it extra legally. And so we should all be on the same page about that, that the laws are very, very good in protecting the data that go into the Census Bureau. Um, and it's not the same as the, the data that's protected at the state where many of us work. Um, it's a higher standard. It's, it's more protection uh, than what we have here. And we take our data very seriously at the state. I've learned this from <laughs> doing data sharing agreements across different states and, and learning what other people's experiences are. Minnesota really holds on tight and really protects the data of its people. It's a great thing. They should be doing that. Um, but we have high standards, and, and the Census Bureau standards are even higher. The laws are even, even um, greater protecting the data. Um, there is a culture of protecting data in the Census Bureau that I haven't seen exist anywhere else. And again, I'm already in a culture where we protect data. Uh, but when you go in, many of you know, some of you have worked for the Census Bureau. When you go into the Census Bureau just as a visitor, it takes a very long time to get in. You are limited in what you're able to bring in. Uh, there are background checks. There is all kinds of security in place just to move physically into the building. And the uh, census workers and, and Census Bureau employees uh, act, they have the practices that, that um, support that climate of um, protection. And so that's a powerful, I would say that those practices are a powerful indicator to me, the culture of, of whether or not these data are, are really, truly protected. From everything that I've seen, absolutely, um, that's, that's the case. Um, I know less about the technology that is protecting answers, but I can say that for those of you involved in the LUCA, that there are really pretty stringent requirements to be able to take census data uh, and review it. We'll talk about the LUCA in a moment, uh, but, but we know that these things are ever on the mind uh, of the folks at the Census Bureau. One of the things that's happening right now, another context for 2020, that's different from past censuses is that funding has been very, very difficult to come by. Um, this typically in this year, a year ending in eight, you would see a ramp up in funding so that the Census Bureau can do uh, three end to end tests were initially planned. Um, and you can see in past censuses in 1990, 2000, 2010, um, that you see a ramp up in funding of hiring to be able to do money for hiring to be able to do these census tests and that there's been little uh, ramp up so far um, in in the current um, context and that the funding, you know, they've been <coughs> operating under continuing resolution after continuing resolution. And so it's been really very difficult to plan um, and to decide kind of what's going to be there um, six months down the road, what's going to be there eight months, 10 months, 12 months down the road. And we're just a couple of years out now, right? <laughs> so there's not all that much time. And they're still kind of working with a shifting budget, not really exactly knowing what, what's coming. Um, there have been some, uh, there are many people who are organized around this, and in fact, Minnesota is among the leaders of, of local folks who are involved in the issue of census funding. There's a group called Minnesotans for the American Community Survey and the Census 2020 I can tell you more about if you want to get involved with them, but they are involved in educating uh, our congressional representatives uh, about uh, why the census is important and how Minnesotans use census data. 
Speaking of why the census are <laughs> the census is important, why the census data are important, I, I mentioned earlier that it affects our representation. There's all kinds of money that gets pushed around from the federal level to the state level or the state level to the community level based on census counts, and we'll look at that in a moment. And of course, we want to make sure that we have decent data so that when we're doing our planning and analysis, it's based on um, something that is accurate and complete. In terms of political representation, one piece of that is congressional reapportionment. Last time around in 2010, we just barely held on to an eighth congressional seat. The states here in gray are the states that uh, were able to hold on to their the number of seats that they had in the 2000 census. The states in um, kind of that brown color lost uh, seats, a congressional seats, and the blue the blue states gained congressional seats. So what happens over the course of the decade is the growth, where the growth is the greatest. That's typically the you know that's where the states who have uh, been growing over the course of the decade will then gain this gain the seat after the next apportionment. Um, and you can see that in the Midwest, uh, where population growth has been uh, less strong in in terms of numbers. Um, but that's where, where the losses tend to be, except for uh, in Louisiana, which uh, Hurricane Sandy may have had something to do with that loss there. Um, the same trends have continued since 2010, 2010 to 2020, that we've seen a lot of growth in Texas, in Florida, and the southwestern states, and we've seen uh, much more moderate growth in the Midwestern states out toward the east. Minnesota is doing pretty well for a Midwestern state, but it doesn't look anything like the growth that's happening uh, in, in other parts of the country, particularly the southwest. So what can we uh, expect in terms of apportionment this time? Um, I believe when I've looked at the numbers that we are really just kind of hanging in there, <laughs> that we're right back to where we were in 2010. And I say that not as being overly optimistic, but having really looked at the uh, formulas that are used to apportion seats and to see how far the margins are in either, in either direction, um, it appears to me that it absolutely is in striking distance as it, to hold on to a seat, at least right now in uh, this month with the data that we have, most recent data are through 2017. Uh, but when we look at kind of the formula, this is just the formula that's used to apportion seats. Uh, the, the method that is used is called the method of equal proportions. It's been in place since 1940. And everyone, the first step is that everyone gets, every state gets one congressional district and then they're doled out one by one after that on the basis of a priority score, and the formula for that priority score is right there. The big trick, and the thing that makes it really tricky, one of the things that makes it really tricky to predict is that a transfer of a congressional seat from one state to another will not happen unless that, uh, unless it will uh, increase the size of the district. In other words, the, the transfer of a seat has to reduce the ratio between uh, the two, uh, any two states. And so, you know, this is the way you can just plug in the 2017 numbers and see that Minnesota's priority score is 1.3 million. Seats are just apportioned based on this very formula. Our eight or nine is the number of seats we have. If we, right now we have eight if we were to gain one. Um, so it's very easy to see when you kind of array all the states in a line, that we're not only competing with kind of the states that are set to lose a congressional seat, we're also kind of um, in competition with, this seat, with the states that are set to gain, in that they have to gain enough <laughs> in order to, to be able to take that seat from us. And so I know it's a little bit complicated, but, um, the main takeaway for us is that, yes, we are kind of on the, the cusp of losing a seat. Uh, we're not only in competition with the states that may lose a seat, but those kind of how much growth is happening among the gainers as well. 
There are a number of groups that have done some projections. They've looked at growth between 2010 and 2017, and also growth between 2016 and 2017. And both projections uh, have Minnesota losing a seat by about 10,000 people to 30,000 people. That's right now. It will certainly change over uh, the next three, two to three years. Um, but this is where we stand right now. So I don't know, is 10,000, is 30,000, is that a big number? Is that a small number? It looks pretty big to me, <laughs> uh, especially considering that we typically gain, um, you know, 30, 35,000 people has been kind of the average per year, uh, but it's not definite, it, it's not um, out of reach. Uh, 10,000 looks like a pretty small number to me, in fact. Um, some things that add more ambiguity to some of these projections. Um, right now we have 2017 data and they are estimates. <laughs> they are not counts. Uh, the first thing they taught me in demography school was don't trust any estimate or even any count. <laughs> don't, don't trust the data. You know, cast a critical eye on all these numbers. And so what we're looking at when we're looking at estimates are really what demographers think have been the growth since the last census. And even that census number is based on a count with an adjustment made for what they think the, the undercount was. And so there's a lot of kind of air in terms of you know, the difference between an estimate and an account, the difference of what will happen between 2017 and 2020. Um, and then finally, <coughs> when people are making the projections for apportionment for 2020, they're making an assumption about growth for all 50 states. And all of those assumptions need to hold in order for the uh, apportionment to be handled uh, in the way that they're expecting it to, to come out. And we all know that um, many times projections are right, but there's plenty of times where they're not. Where they're not, and it's a pretty tall order to say that those projections are going to hold for all the states uh, that that are being projected for. In terms of last time, you know, it's, again to address the question of you know, thir ten thousand to thirty thousand, is that a big number? Is that a small number? Um, in terms of, you know, how well we do in a count, uh, last time on net, Minnesota overcounted. We're overachievers. We overcounted by about 30,000 people. That doesn't mean we didn't miss people. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> but on net, when we look at everyone that we either double counted or missed, uh, we had a, a surplus, an estimated surplus of about 30,000 people. There's a huge range in the overcount and the undercount estimates. It goes from, you know, 238,000 of an undercount in Texas last time was the estimate to about 150,000 uh, in New York. So a, a big range. Minnesota tends to be on the overcount. Or this last time was on the overcounting side. Um, if you want to play with these numbers, the apportionment number, there's a calculator online if you don't want to. <laughs> use that specific formula. I just wanted to let you know from my alma mater, the Population Study Center at Michigan has a calculator. Uh, you can just plug numbers in and kind of see how small changes uh, change the reapportionment picture. So I mentioned that on net we gained, we uh, overcounted in the 2010 census, uh, but un underlying that number, there was somewhere between about 83,000 to 172,000 people who were missed. That's the confidence interval around the estimate of people who were missed. Uh, we overcounted or counted people that we shouldn't have in Minnesota, somewhere around 100 to 300,000 people. Uh, and then about 52,000 people were imputed, meaning um, they, their neighbors were asked about how many people live there. Um, they weren't, they didn't directly fill out a form uh, or didn't um, speak directly with an enumerator, but they went to other kinds of data to come up with this number. And so I show this to you just to give you a sense of kind of where the wiggle room is again <laughs> in the apportionment. I'm not saying it'll look like this again this time, but there's a lot of range there in terms of who we miss, who we count. And certainly this time when there's a lot up in the air with the funding for the Census Bureau and some of the operations that have not been tested yet. And, uh, you know, the potential addition of a citizenship question that makes people concerned to answer questions. 
there's a lot up in the air about how complete this count will be, uh, and that will certainly play a role eventually in, in the apportionment that we eventually get. So for me, when I look at these numbers, yeah, 10 to 30,000 right now, that looks pretty big, but there's a lot of kind of uh, estimation error uh, that, that goes on in the taking of a census. Heresy, right? <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> Just to give you a sense of how we've grown, we have seen an uptick in growth in Minnesota in the last couple of years. Uh, it's been a very uh, good year for us in terms of a strong economy and very low unemployment. So we would expect to see uh, migration be responsive to those conditions. And indeed, we that's, that's what is driving the change. It's not births. Um, and so you can see that, that um, things are going in the di right direction for us there. I just wanted to mention again, in relation to the apportionment count, um, you know, particularly even if the citizenship question doesn't get added to the census form, there is a lot of concern just because of the current climate around immigration. There's a lot of concern that there are people who will not feel safe filling out their forms. And these folks are not distributed equally across the U.S. Uh, you know, this is just one example uh, that comes from Pew Research on the number of unauthorized residents in each state. And you can see um, that some states have a larger proportion. That's not to say, you know, necessarily that the count will be uh, worse in those states, but I think it's going to be a greater challenge in states that have a higher proportion of immigrants or a higher proportion of people who are unauthorized. Okay, that's my whole spiel on apportionment. <laughs> Let's bring it back to a few of the other things that uh, the census is used for and what we're doing here in Minnesota, and then we'll open it up for, for questions and discussion. Uh, we use the uh, counts here in Minnesota to redistrict, to make equal size uh, le legislative districts for the House and for the Senate. Uh, here at the state legislature, and you can see that the districts in greater Minnesota tend to be larger, where the population is less dense. And then we also use the numbers to um, distribute funds. That's, like I said, we do it at the state level through the LGA formula, for example. Um, it's just one example of, of um, state funding that is based ultimately on a census count. Uh, they're based on population estimates produced by the Met Council and produced by the state of Minnesota, but we base the initial count each decade on the decennial census count. Um, George Washington University has done a study recently called Counting for Dollars, where they looked at the 16 largest federal programs state by state to come up with a number of how much money is uh, allocated to each state on the basis of a census count. And you can see that for Minnesota, that comes out to about $8.4 billion each year. Um, and that's typically in place from over the course of the decade, say from 2020 to 2030. Um, and that per capita number is about $1,500 per person. So kind of as a rule of thumb, it's not, it's not exactly accurate to say each missed person will cost the state that, <laughs> but in general, that is the number, uh, the per capita number of funding, federal funding that we get from these 16 largest programs. And so for people who don't care about the census for the census sake, how could it be, right? Um, you know, people care about Head Start, they care about SNAP, they care about WIC, they care about Medicaid, they care about CHIP. Um, you know, these are all programs that have some basis in their funding to Minnesota. It has some basis in the decennial count. And so there's good reason for many people uh, to care about how good of a count, how accurate and complete our count will be. Now I want to turn and talk a little bit about what's happening here at the state of Minnesota. We have worked for the last year, and many of you are working. Can I see a show of hands of people who are doing something with the LUCA? The LUCA. <laughs> There's a couple of people, at least one. <laughs> so it's the local update of census addresses. 
And what it does is it takes the Census Bureau's master address file, all of the addresses that the Census Bureau has, and allows uh, states and counties and cities to compare what they have in terms of administrative records against that master address file, and then give feedback about what is missing, what's in the wrong place, um, what needs to be admit, uh, omitted. Um, this is a program that is, uh, that many of our cities and counties and that the state of Minnesota is participating in to make sure that the frame, the universe for the 2020 census is a good one. Um, the counties here in yellow are the counties that have signed up in Minnesota to participate in the LUCA and the counties in gray have not declined to sign up, uh, but those are counties that the state will be uh, doing the LUCA on behalf of, of those counties. Typically when they've declined, it's because they've been small and haven't had the, <clears throat> excuse me, they're small and they don't have the capacity to do the checks themselves or they don't have the data. So that's something that we're doing um, on behalf of some of those <coughs> counties. And tribal uh, governments have the opportunity to do it as well. Thank you. I didn't mention that. Um, and some in Minnesota have signed up and others have not. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're working right now on forming a state level complete count committee. That's a committee that is uh, created to do outreach um, in the states. There are local complete count committees as well that, that are formed by local governments or by community groups. And these are just kind of the vehicle through which outreach tends to happen. Uh, and so right now we're working on a state level committee that um, there wasn't one last time around. This is something that the Census Bureau is really pushing um, in terms of how it would like to um, distribute information uh, and, and support outreach at a, at a state level. They wanna see states putting together complete count committees and um, we are complying, <laughs> we're working on that. Um, we will be kind of announcing more details about that coming up next month. Uh, it'll be part of a two-year campaign that this um, committee will be working on census outreach um, throughout Minnesota. Who are the three? <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Let's see. There are. I can tell you who has agreed. So, uh, Sharon Sales Belton has agreed to be a co-chair. Kathy Annette, who's part of the Blandin Foundation and then the commissioner of the Department of Administration, which is our department in the state of Minnesota. And I can't tell you the fourth, <laughs> but I hope that person will agree as well. <laughs> They're checking with their board. <laughs> um, we've been working really hard over the last few months to try to get cities and counties up and going in terms of their complete count committees as well. We've been doing a number of workshops to tell cities and counties what, you know, what they can do to, to start preparing to do the outreach around the 2020 census. Um, and we have uh, three more workshops coming up. We've been traveling around and then I believe we're set to schedule another round uh, as well. But right now that's kind of what we've been doing in conjunction with the Association of Minnesota Counties and League of Minnesota Cities, trying to get as many people up and ready to go as quickly as we possibly can um, to do this outreach. Most people say it's way too early to start this. We can do this later. And I tell them everything that I have read from 2010, this is you know, my first census being in this role, but everything I've read, everyone says start early. <laughs> we have all these great ideas that can't be put into practice because we didn't start early enough. We didn't get the funding request in or we didn't get, you know, meet the deadlines that need to happen. And so um, we're encouraging people to, even if they're not, actively promote it. They shouldn't be actively promoting yet <laughs> to citizens. Or they'll just get fatigued or to residents or they'll get fatigued. Uh, but they should be kind of getting those relationships in place and getting ready to, to be able to do that over the next year and a half. Finally, I want to tell you about a group called the Minnesota Census Mobilization Partnership that is coming out of the Minnesota Council on Foundations in part. They're really interested in the quality and accuracy of the census in Minnesota. And they we've been working very closely with them to kind of figure out how we move forward to do outreach activities. 
It's something of a three-legged race. We're, again, figuring it out as we go along. Um, the other leg being the Census Bureau. We're, <laughs> we're kind of figuring out how this outreach thing goes. Uh, but so far, you know, the relationships are are open, and we're just kind of um, all in it to, to do our very best uh, for Minnesota this time around. And so with that, that's what I know about. I know some more things about the census, but that's what I prepared to share you <laughs> share with you about the census. Are there questions for me? Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I, I was intrigued with your comments early about race ethnicity. Yeah. Because uh, I've, I've had chats with people from the census for the last few years uh, at conferences and stuff, and I've seen their report, their yeah. recommendation. And so I, I, I was anticipating that, uh, so I was surprised to see that you, you say the current thinking is to keep it separate, and, and, I, and I didn't see the, the MENA category, the Middle East, Northern yeah. African category. Yeah. So, okay. so, so, so what, what's happened? Um, I would say that this is the Census Bureau speaking in research is absolutely um, in line with what you described, that they think that it better, what it seems to, it seems to be a better measurement of how people understand their own race slash ethnicity to include Hispanic ethnicity as a category within the race as a single category. Um, and it also seems to capture a different dimension to include that in the middle of the North African category. That hasn't changed in terms of what the Census Bureau is uh, proposing would be best, but what has happened is, and maybe Todd, you have more details about this, as I understand it, this was an administration decision to, uh, or the, the Census Bureau ran out of time because OMB didn't uh, make the call about whether that shift could be changed. Did I yeah, care to direct that? Yeah. The, um. the, the Federal Interagency Work Group on Race Categories sent a recommendation to OMB 12 months ago, and the OMB director has refused to act on it and refused to answer questions about um, tactically killing the proposal. Um, so, yeah, they, when, they went, they, when they went into the field and with the field test, they needed to have some way of something with the call to keep it as is um, without having the approval of OMB. Um, to, Okay. Yay! <laughs> I know. It's a bummer. But I will say, I will say, there are a lot of people in Minnesota, particularly African American or black people, who are really excited about being able to fill out um, that open ended question. So while <coughs> those, some of the direction that this is going isn't what any of us as researchers would like to see, um, at least there are very minor. Yeah. Do you think the Trump administration has done any analysis of, of what a low count would do and take out some Trump supporters as and maybe or a number of recent immigrants or illegals? And, and do you think they've ever thought about that in terms of how it would affect the uh, like if Minnesota drops a legislature one? Great. So the, maybe. Yeah. Uh, more likely one less Trump supporting. Right. So the question is, has the Trump administration considered the impact of, uh, of what a lower count would mean? Yeah, if discrediting well, the count would have on, assume that on the only the of House of Representatives changes Minnesota. Is yeah. Like one one or else? yeah, so I've heard, I've heard people uh, say that they believe there are political motivations behind having a low count. Uh, there are political uh, motivations be behind introducing the citizenship question or pushing the citizenship question. I, I declined to comment on that. I have no idea. <laughs> but I know what the impact is likely to be. And the impact is likely to be a lower count. I don't know. I haven't looked specifically at what that might mean. Uh, in terms of the shift of power, uh, but but that's a, yeah that's something people think <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. Does the lower funding reduce the count disproportionately in certain neighborhoods and people groups than others? Yeah, absolutely. So I didn't talk about the groups that are historically hard to count, 
but they tend to be people with language barriers, people who are highly mobile. Uh, they tend to be people of color, but that's really correlated with the mobility and with income and education. Um, and it is those groups that are likely to be missed in general, but also likely to be missed if there's less funding for the Census Bureau because they're more difficult to find and have uh, maybe more difficult to find and maybe more difficult to convince to fill out the census form or to assure that it's safe to do so. Um, part of what's happening this time around is the number of partnership specialists is being reduced by about a third. Uh, partnership specialists typically over Census Bureau employees who have uh, the job of doing the outreach for the Census Bureau. And so that's already going down. And so what we're trying to do as a state is to, you know, do what we can to try to fill in those gaps. We're we're small but mighty in my office. There, <laughs> we have a five-person office. We were given, you know, another person and a half specifically by the legislature last time, for funding for another person and a half to help do that and help do outreach. Uh, but it's a pretty big job for a few number of people, uh, and it's. Uh, funding situation that's going to be really tight and that we've already seen uh, as having implications. Some of the funding has already kind of, we've seen what it means to, to have a very tight budget at the Census Bureau. There's not a lot of people around doing this work. Yeah? Yes, the schools are seeing a decrease in uh, English learners, um, which we believe is also tied to the political climate. Um, do you believe that that uh, lessening, lessening of immigration is more likely to impact Minnesota in terms of getting uh, retaining our eighth congressional seat? I know that you know the the vast the vast majority of our growth from migration um, is coming from international migration. And even a fair amount of our births are coming from foreign-born women. So that sure has been one of the sources of the way that we've grown. I would have to look more carefully at all of those other states and how it might potentially <laughs> impact them. Because it's not it's not straightforward that if, for example, we're we're impacted in that way, that any other state isn't going to be more impacted that way. But um, it certainly is a factor for how we grow. Okay. I have a second question. Yeah. Um, yeah, you had referred to uh, non-response uh, potentially uh, using administrative records. Yeah. Has, has that been done before, and what's your opinion of how it would be done and how it would impact the accuracy? A lot of people are concerned about that. So the question was um, using administrative records for non-response follow-up. How, how is the impact? Both how would it be done and what would the impact be? Um, I think right now what I understand is CARA, which is can you help me, Joanna? <laughs> Center for Administrative Records Research. Thank you. Center for Administrative Records Research. Uh, they're doing the testing right now on uh, state's administrative data to be able to tell if it's a viable option to use as non-response follow-up. Um, and a lot of these things are still up in the air. So the funding's up in the air, and exactly how some of these operations are going to be carried out are still up in the air. Um, because non-response follow-up is one of the last operations, I'm sure it's one of the last, one of the last that we'll, we'll hear has been decided. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, if you think about, you know, is that a good way to follow up? Uh, um, people, at least it's a it's an administrative record that we have for some people who are really hard to count, the most vulnerable people in Minnesota. And we have a record. We know, for example, if they're receiving SNAP or WIC or TAN and FIP benefits, um, that may be more than being able to catch. That may be better or more complete than being able to catch a neighbor and hope that they have. Accurate. It may not. I have not. <laughs> I can't tell you. I don't know what would be better, but but it certainly that's that's the question we're trying to answer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, the Census Bureau has been doing a lot of 
reliance or at least emphasis on uh, administrative records to do the non-response follow-up. Is that sort of an interim step and the, the more traditional response with the numerators is still there? But That's right. They're doing this because I'm guessing funding cuts mean there will be many fewer enumerators? Right. So as I understand it, the decision has not yet been made, although maybe you know Todd, um, that how many um, how many non-response follow-up visits a person will receive, but there will be in-person non-response follow-up. It's not, it's not off the table. Uh, the question is how many and at what point do they shift over and say, well, we don't know what we can do, what do we have in terms of administrative records. And in that case, I certainly think that's better than, <laughs> that's better than nothing, right? We <laughs> have something on Todd, would you have anything? I don't know more than that. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we're almost at time. We have time for one more question. I'm happy to stay and keep talking with y'all. For those of you who have to take off, and, and I'll just maybe talk to you. But if there's one more question, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, with like outreach activities, what do those entail? Are you like knocking on doors and educating people about the census, or what does yeah. that look like? So the question is, what do outreach activities entail? Or not being what exactly. Um, it really is left up to the community and community groups to decide what is the best uh, way to go. Right now, part of what the Minnesota Council and Foundation has done has to hire uh, a group called Grassroots Solutions to come up with a plan to be able to do some authentic, you know, what they call authentic engagement around the census, which is building those relationships and building the trust in advance of uh, the actual census showing up <laughs> at someone's front door. So it may, in some circumstances, maybe it would look like door knocking, but I would imagine that it would also have kind of a longer term uh, relationship building component. Um, longer term, you know, we've got two years, but <laughs> we'll be using, you know, existing networks of people um, and, and doing some of that education and trust building. Um, do the plan. That's not very specific about what's going to happen because I don't know yet. <laughs> but they're knocking maybe part of it. Okay, thanks everyone. With that, thank you. Thanks for coming. Just before you go, a reminder that we meet on the second Wednesday of every month at Wild. They're usually on the second floor. And if you're interested, our April 11 next month. Uh, monthly meetup is going to be on uh, the Olmsted Quality of Life Study, which is a study of the experience of people with disabilities. And the research team of Aaron Nyquist and Kylie Nicholas from Improve Group will be presenting. Thanks for coming today. Another round of applause for Susan. Thanks.